Welcome everyone to the next seminar from our uh, mini symposium. Thank you, the organizer, to for organizing this very nice symposium and for the invitation. The invitation, and I would like to formalize mathematically the pro experimental protocol that Claudia told you before, and I also formalize the mathematical model that we use to formalize all this uh, this problem. And uh, in the end, I will speak a little bit about the model selection procedure that we use in this class of model. So the motivation is this uh, experimental protocol that Claudia told you before. So we have some stochastic stimuli and we expose some volunteer to this uh, stochastic stimuli while we record some behavioral or physiological answer. In my case today, I will speak uh, about physiological answers, okay? So I will speak in, the, in particular in the case when we have some auditory stimuli and the answer, the physiological answer that we are recording are electroencephalographic data, which basically record the electrical activity from the brain. In the mathematical point of view, we have some functions uh, and, uh, as answer. Okay, so we have strong bits, weak bits, and silent units, and these are our unit of uh, stimuli. If you want to uh, generate some sample, some stochastic sample from this, one way of doing is starting from the deterministic sequence, 211, 211, 211 you can erase each one uh, by a zero and then we will have something like that. So for instance, in the deterministic, in the deterministic case, the stimuli will be something to ta ta to ta ta to ta ta. And when we erase some of the weak bits, like in these cases here, we will have something like to ta to ta ta to Okay, so this will be basically the kind of stimuli that we expose to our volunteers. Okay, and this is one way of generating this kind of, of, of stochastic stimuli. If you want to generate step by step this stochastic stimuli or stochastic sequence, you can do it in the following, in the following way. So if you want to know what is happening in the x n step? And I don't give you any kind of hint. You, the best you can do is yes, right? But if I tell you that actually in the step n minus one, uh, the last stimuli was a strong bit or a two in our numerical sequence, then in this case, you know that you have, for instance, so we have in this we are in this situation so these are our last step the kind of last step we can do we can have so the next step when you saw a two a, a two a strong bit is either a one with probability one minus epsilon or a zero with probability uh, epsilon but in both cases, you know how to what to expect right so you know how to generate at least in a probabilistic point of view what is going on in the end step. So here we will have something for this step here, we will have something like that. So the probability of having a zero after a two, it's epsilon. The probability of having a one after a two is one minus epsilon. I'm sorry for my case. Okay, he's singing a lot today. So, but in the other hand, if I tell you that actually in the n minus one step, it's a one, we will have basically two kinds of one. So either you have a one, which comes after a two, and then for this case, we have either a one or I don't have any case here. I, I will put one here and then you can have a zero here. So if you are in this kind of ones, the ones which comes after uh, a two, 
then you can have a one with probability one minus epsilon and a zero with probability epsilon. So you are basically in this case. So it's the ones which comes from twos, right? But you also can have ones, a second type of ones, which comes after a one. So I'm, I have this kind of one, which is coming from another one, or this kind of ones, which are coming from zeros, right? And in both cases, uh, even those uh, which come from ones or which come after zeros, you will have a, one, a two here with probability one, right? So we either in this case or this case here, we have this kind of behavior. So if you have a one followed by a one, then for sure you have a two with probability one. If you have a zero for a one which come after a zero, you will have a one, a two with probability one. Okay, this is the the point. So in the end of the day, we have split this this guy here in three different situations, right? So basically, the ones which comes after two, and the ones which comes after either a zero or a one, right? And for each one of these situations, this for each one of these uh, this kind of ones, we have a different kind of uh, transition probability, okay? And the same will happen if I give you the hint, if I tell you that actually in the time n minus one, we have a zero. We will have two kinds of zeros, the ones which comes after a two, so this kind here, the blue ones, and we have also the red ones, which are the zeros which are coming after ones or zeros. So for the red ones, for the red ones, we have a two with probability one. So I'm in this situation here. Uh, which one? These ones. So in this case, we have for sure a two with probability one. And for this case, also we will have a two in the next step with probability one. And for the green ones, uh, the blue ones, the zero, these guys here, uh, no, eh, these guys here, the blue ones, we are in this kind of situation. So we have a one with probability one minus epsilon and we can generate a zero with probability epsilon. So in all of these cases, I have split here in three kind of different situations. But doesn't matter which one I'm looking at, and doesn't matter which one is happening at time n or n minus one, I will be able to generate what is happening in time n if I have, uh, because I have the transition probabilities well defined. Okay, so basically we are splitting all the possible uh, symbols that which can have up to time n in seven different situations, either finishing in two. Or two one 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 zero one two zero one zero and zero zero. So this set here, it's a partition of all possible paths, and uh, for each one of the situations, we have some transition probability associated. So given a past, we associate a context, a uh, element of the set, which are called contexts. Okay, and uh, once I have a context associated, I can use the transition probability to generate the next step, okay? The formal definition of all these two objects that I just uh, speak, the tree and the map, the table with uh, transitions probability, we can formalize it as follows. So suppose we have some uh, string here. So for instance, all this, uh, it's a string U. Uh, I don't think you are seeing. I will put it in red. So I will say that V is uh, actually U is a suffix of V if uh, V is bigger in some sense, like V is all this. So this is the present. And U, uh, U is something is uh, shorter, but uh, shorter in the past, okay? A context tree we can define it as follows. So a context tree for us is something which has two uh, basic properties. The one, the, the first one is the suffix property, 
which mathematically means the following. No string W, it's a proper suffix of another string, S. What this mean in our picture, in our uh, hierarchical way of doing the tree? So this is just saying that actually uh, the set that we are using to partition the past is only with the leaves. So I'm not considering in this picture any uh, internal node, only the leaves, okay? This is how we translate the suffix property. And we also need irreducibility. What does this mean in the, our uh, scheme before? So this means that actually no terminal branch is the only child. This means that when you construct this hierarchical extractor, you will not have something like that, for instance. And then a terminal branch with only one child here. Because if I have this kind of situation, I can just uh, run this branch and uh, actually replace this guy here for us uh, something smaller, which is this one here. And I still have this only leaf property that uh, is the suffix property. So this cannot happen. And uh, the way we define this kind of not accepting this behavior is with this irreducibility. This is something that we, we have to guarantee in order to have uh, the smallest past possible, okay? So, if I have a context tree, now I want to define a context tree model, how, how I use this, this tree to generate stochastic samples. So given that I have a context tree model, I will associate for each one of my contexts a, a transition probability. So I also need some family of transitions probabilities. And I will define some context function CT, which basically at each step will uh, search in your uh, past what, what is the smallest past possible or the smallest past needed in order to um, generate, generate the next step. This is what we, uh, it's right in here. So what this C function makes is basically find the context W in your tree uh, associated to any kind of past, okay? And then we use this. So C, we work here. And once we found the context associated, we will use the transition uh, probability associated to this context to generate the next step, okay? Uh, the condition two is only saying that uh, this city is the this function is actually found found, found the smallest relevant path. Okay, so I cannot look at any smallest path than my context and still have enough information to predict what is to generate the next step. This is uh, what condition two is saying. Uh, very uh, quick. A word about context tree models. They are uh, also called the stochastic chain with memory of variable length and variable length Markov chains. And they were introduced by Hissening as a universal system of data compression in 1983. Okay. okay, up to now, I have defined our stochastic stimuli, right? Remember that we have here a guy, and then we have some stimuli and some answer. I have defined unto you this part. So this is well defined, at least uh, formally defined with the last slide. But I still have to define this, and also I have to define the relation between this and this. And this relation is uh, the model that we introduced in the territory. Okay. So in order to define this, we have to basically uh, decide or formalize how these answers depend on the sequence of stimuli. And then we have something like that. Let me erase this quickly. What we are supposing, we, what we are assuming is the following. Suppose we have xk, xk minus 1, xk minus 2, xk minus 3. And suppose also that up to time k, our context is this guy here. So this green stuff is the relevant par part of the path that we need in order to generate the next step in this chain x k plus one, okay? Our, uh, our assumption, the 
uh, the assumption that we are assuming that the brain is doing or the way that we are defining our model is this green part is also responsible for generating the k answer okay so the law of this k answer will depend on this only this green part okay then once we generate a next step k plus one step i have to do it the same so for this past, I will look at the context associated in the stimuli sequence. So here I will look, for instance, this uh, part of the past. And this will be responsible to generate the next step in my stimuli sequence, but also the answer associated to uh, step K plus one in my uh, answer uh, sequence. This means that actually uh, my functions here my EEG functions, I will put it in green because this is what makes sense. So these functions in this step and the functions in these steps are generated by loss, which actually depends on this green part, only this green part, and this one depends only on the red ones, okay? And so on. So now I here, here I can look at the next step. For instance, this is the context, and this will generate the... K, this is K1 and this is K2 steps, okay? So this is the way we define a model where you have answers and these answers depend uh, depends not only on the single stimuli at the, the K time, but also uh, of depend on the context associated to this stimuli sequence up to this time, okay? Formally, how we say that? So the model uh, is called sequence of random objects driven by context-free models. And what we need in order to define this model? Well, the first thing is we have some uh, bivariate stochastic chain, well, right? The stimuli and the answer one. Uh, the stimuli one, we are supposing that uh, it's assuming some finite, uh, it's assuming values in some finite alphabet. And YN for us, in this case, are functions, for instance, but could be something else. Um, and the first thing we need is, well, our sequence of stimuli, it's a context-free model with parameters tau and p. And conditioning in the in this stimuli sequence, uh, the answers are independent. So if I give you all the stimuli sequence, I will decide what, I will, what, I, what, what is the answer, what is this uh, brain answer in an independent way, okay? And also, I will not need to look at all the paths, but only the context associated, okay? So at each step, is the way I just um, make the, the figure for you. So at each step here, I will figure it out, figure it out uh, what is the brain is doing, by choosing independently from each one, but uh, from each answer, right? But uh, the law are depending on the context associated. So this is coming from the stimuli, right? Giving the sequence of stimuli, I found my context and given the constant context, I will generate a piece of function, a piece of EEG, associated to this context, okay? What we know uh, about context-free models, not the functional one or the bivariated one, only context-free models. We know that we know how to estimate trees. We know estimate trees and actually estimate also the transitions probability. This you can do it using algorithm context or the information criterion. These two here are constant dependent. So you need to choose a constant and then use this to penalize your uh, likelihood, for instance. And then uh, this will be uh, estimation for your tree, but estimation which depends on constant. And this uh, procedure here can just uh, choose the optimal constant in both uh, procedures here. So if you apply either contest, algorithm contest in SMC, uh, SMC or BAC and SMC, in the end of the day, you you have uh, estimated free and constant free, okay? This is for context three models. What we, wanna do, what we want to do now is, well, we have here 
a sequence of stimuli, x1, xn. And for this, we know how to estimate a tree. But we use this to uh, stimulate some someone, so, right? So to as a stimuli from to our uh, to our experiment, and then we have x1, x2, xn as an answer. What we want to define now is how to uh, estimate a tree from this sample, this function. So this is how we can find a tree in this set now. Okay, this is what I will do it now in the time that I still have. So. The way we do it is basically with some adaptation of uh, algorithm context uh, and uh, some projective method. So I will start explaining to you what is the algorithm context. Suppose in some way that you know how to construct the biggest tree possible, which makes sense for our uh, stimulation, uh, stimuli sequence, okay? I'm not defining the, big, the biggest tree, but suppose that you have it. Once you have it, what we will do? We will choose one of these terminal branches. So, for instance, I'm choosing this red one here. And I will test this branch statistically. I'm not telling you how to test statistically. I'm just saying that I will find a, criteria, a statistical criterion and I will say that this, uh, this is my criterion to prune or keep a branch. Okay? So, I will do it for this branch here. And then I test if I prune or keep, and I will decide. If my statistical criterion say prune, I will just uh, cut this branch and put this guy here instead, and then I will do it in the next branch, for instance, this one, okay? And then I will make the same question with my statistical criterion, prune or keep. So in the end, and we will do it up to having test all branches possible. For instance, if I have some zero on three, Suppose that this is the biggest tree possible, and then I will apply my general algorithm context here. I'm not telling you how to construct the biggest tree, either the statistical uh, criterion. Just suppose that we have something to define it, and we will see how uh, the general idea works, okay? So for instance, I prune the first branch, and the second one, and the third one, and then the fourth one, and the next one, and the next, and then I leave this one and put this, this guy here. I could it too. And I keep doing, keep doing, keep doing up to the end. So if this is my last three, what does this mean? That actually I test, tested this branch and then I decided uh, to keep it. So I keep it. This one, I keep it. This one, I keep it. But for instance, these ones, I cut it. This one, I cut it. This one I cut it. So this is uh, the final result of uh, some general algorithm contest, the context. Okay, and this is the tree that we have in the end. Uh, notice that my tree in the end is only the leaves, right? We are not taking inter uh, any uh, internal node. Uh, this is just to define how to use the biggest tree. Maybe I will not speak about that. I think I don't have much time yet. So I'll just skip this. And I will go to this uh, projective method. This is uh, our prone or keep criterion, okay? So prone or keep criterion for, suppose we have the biggest tree possible and then we want to prune or keep some um, branch. In this case, in particular, I'm choosing this branch, this branch here. In our protocol experimental, experimental uh, for instance. So 0, 1, 2 and 1, 1, 2. What we want to do, we will find in the sample each time that each one of the sequence appears. So for instance, it's appearing here, 112, 112, 112, and appearing in green here, 012, 012. Each time that this, this uh, sequence appears, I will cut this part here, this green, this purple part here in the, the sample and put it in some set that I'm calling here. Let me do it like that. So this is purple, I will put it in red here. Oops, no. Here, I will put in this set and the green ones, each piece of green uh, part that I'm 
taking here, I will put in the set. Okay, so I will find in my sample each occurrence of 0, 1, 2 or 1, 1, 2 and take pieces of EG and put in these uh, respective sets. So in the end, what I will have, I will have two big sets of, of functions, right? This uh, Y012 and Y112. And my statistical criterion to decide to run or keep the branch will be the following. I will test this two sets. So now I have one, one set here associated to this guy and another set associated to this guy. And the question that I'm, I will do it is statistically, are the law of these two sets equal or not? So if they have the same law, actually uh, the fact they have a zero or a one here is not making any difference to generate the, the law, right? To decide the law of the EG. So if they have the same law, I will prune the branch. And if I, just, I, I uh, realize that actually they have different laws, if I prove that they have different laws, <coughs> then I keep the branch. Okay, so this is my uh, prune or keep stati the statistical criteria. Take the stat associated to the sequence and uh, comparing the loss. Okay, now is missing to say how we test the loss. So in our example, this is y of 0, 1, 2 and y of 1, 1, 2. So I have here two uh, sets of functions and I want to test if they have equal or different loss. And this we do it uh, through projective method. How we do it for each one of these functions in each one of the sets, I will project them in some random direction. And in order to have some uh, uh, to satisfy the the hypothesis the, of the method, we need something which is Gaussian. So this random direction has to be Gaussian. This is why we take Brownian motions, for instance, or Brownian bridges. So if I do it for each one of these functions, I project in this Brownian motion. I will have here a set of points, right, in R. And here I will have another set of points in R. So instead of looking at this purple or green uh, piece of functions, I will look at this purple or green uh, points. And then I have now two sets of points on R. And then for these guys, we know how to test uh, low equality, right? For instance, using some commemorative Smirnoff test. And then what uh, Cuesta d'Alberto co-authors proved in 2006 is if we prove that, if we check, if we apply some statistical test and see that actually these laws are different, so are the original ones, they were the, the ones which are not projected. Okay, so this is what we do in order to test this prune or keep criterion that we have, uh, that I'm trying to define to you. Okay. Uh, just to be a little bit formal, this is the way we adapt the, the Komogorov Smirnov to the projected sample. So these are the empirical distributions of the projected data. Uh, this is the Komogorov Smirnov distance be between these uh, empirical distributions. Uh, and this is something that we need when you are applying uh, Komogorov Smirnov test to, to samples. Okay. And once we have not only, but sometimes you can have three uh, contexts in the same branch and we want to decide to the, the whole branch. So we have here U, V, and W. So we have more than two to, to decide, right? To, to this homograph is mean enough, I, can, I just can apply to two samples. And here I have at least three. So we will take the maximum of this, of this uh, statistical, uh, all this possible, uh, homogorophic mean of distances, okay? And then we apply this criterion. If this maximum is smaller than a branch, then I would just say that everyone here, all these three sets has the same law, and then I go prune. And if I have something which is bigger than C, so at least for one of these pairs, there is a difference in law, so I will keep the branch, okay? Just, uh, okay, some hypothesis in order to make the uh, projective method, we need some conditions on the law of the EG, like uh, Kalman conditions and continuity. And of course, if I have, if I want to check 
difference in laws in the sets, I need that they have difference, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, I will not be able to apply the statistical test. If we have all this and we have a sample big enough, we can uh, uh, prove that actually we have here a sample that we know, which are, which are generating our stimuli, and then we use that to, to stimulate some volunteer, and then I have here functions, right? And then what we prove is, well, if this tree, tau, this tau tree here generated the model, in the end, I will find here, I will estimate here some tau uh, hat, which is the same that we, uh, the one which are generating our stimuli, okay? <coughs> Just a small word about filter. Uh, we could apply, for instance, what we have been doing is applying algorithm contest and projective method. We could think about other kind of ways of uh, prune and keep branches, right? Uh, the only problem is that we are using set of functions, for instance. So we, we have to have some criteria which can deal with a set of functions. And even though other statistics without the algorithm context, but yet we have to think all the time that actually we are working with functions. So we don't have, for instance, uh, likelihoods. We cannot apply likelihoods for functions. Okay. And these are the main reference. So the mathematical approach, some uh, MATLAB toolbox where you can find all this code in order to apply this statistical criteria to different kind of data for functions or not functions. Even if you have some al finite alphabet as answer, you you can find ways of applying this statistical protocol to that. Uh, this is available in GitHub freely, and we have also this. Uh, the results applied at a, a data in this uh, in this reference, and I believe that Nozni will speak more in more details for you in a few minutes. This is it. Thank you. <laughs>